but uh, as bad as all that is, it's the Wagner Act that probably did more damage and explains the 37 collapse better than, uh, than anything else. This was formerly known as the National Labor Relations Act, uh, sometimes referred to as Labor's Magna Carta. Uh, it, uh, uh, it bestowed vast new uh, powers upon organized labor. It took organized, uh, it took labor disputes, I should say, out of the ordinary courts and turned them over to be settled by a new body called the National Labor Relations Board, which we still have today, presidential appointees. Um, uh, to help settle uh, labor disputes. It made it far easier for organized labor to, uh, to strike, to organize, and it went on the warpath. The number, there was a study a few years ago by two UCLA economists showing that the number of strike days uh, from 1936 to 1937, as the Wagner Act took hold, rose, it doubled from about 14 million strike days, that would be like uh, 14 million people on strike for one day or 7 million on strike for two or however, but 14 million strike days in 1936 to 28 million strike days in 1937. The year of the uh, uh, sit-down strikes in Flint and Saginaw and Detroit, Michigan that shut down the auto plants, industrial production under the weight of this wave of union militancy plummeted. Labor costs soared. Not what you need in the midst of a depression when profits have already been under assault by any number of other uh, influences. The economy, uh, some of these special privileges, by the way, Congress will later whittle away at. It'll make possible state right to work laws and so forth. Uh, but in 37, we got the worst of it all uh, as the Wagner Act uh, took effect. The economy will linger in depression. The war begins, of course, for us at the end of 1941, uh, for, for Europe a couple of years before that. Some people look at the war and they say, well, that's what finally got us out of depression. And uh, there is there's a, a kernel of truth in that, uh, but a lot of potential for dangerous conclusions. Wars are usually financed to a great extent by uh, an expansion of money and credit. And so when that happens, sometimes you get a lift, short-term lift in the economy, but it's not because we're taking things of value and blowing them up. It's because of the monetary effects of financing the conflict. We took 11 million unemployed and sent them to Europe. That helped on the unemployment rate. Uh, but when you look at measures of consumer welfare, during the war years, you don't see much improvement. People's lives didn't change. We weren't buying cars because they weren't making them, or refrigerators. You know, we had price controls and rationing. You really didn't get a sustained and noticeable recovery in consumer welfare until after the war. Until, um, in fact, uh, until after Roosevelt, who dies in March of 1945. It's not an exaggeration to say the economy recovered when Roosevelt didn't. Uh, in, in 1945. And you have to give Harry Truman a little bit of credit. When he was president, you didn't have the same level of constant attack on Wall Street and people of enterprise. He got rid of some of the more radical New Dealers. It was a bit more or less hostile uh, to business administration after the war. Uh, and then, of course, you had a drastic reduction in uh, federal expenditures after the war, which helped uh, a sick economy uh, recover. Well, he, to sum up, he who can look at this parade of events from the monetary policy of the 20s and 30s that was so erratic, so harmful, to the closing of the borders, the jacking up of, ter of, uh, of taxes, and all the other interventions I've mentioned, and say that the Great Depression was caused by the free market, and that government as an innocent bystander had to come in and save us is, is just utterly, woefully misinformed. This is one of the saddest chapters in economic history and the blame for it should rest squarely and completely at the doorstep of government. With that, I uh, thank you for, for being so attentive and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you.
Uh, I've actually got um, I've got two questions actually. Um, I'd one like to get your opinion on uh, Ron Paul's uh, auditing the Fed initiative uh, currently underway, um, and the other um, I'd like to hear your opinions on uh, President Ob President Obama's uh, uh, bank stress tests. Okay. <laughs> uh, boy, I'm probably I'm more stressed out about what he's doing than I think the banks are. Uh, on your first question about Ron Paul's effort to audit the Fed, well, I'm all in favor of it, uh, but uh, and I know Ron will be the first to, to add a little addendum here that, that that effort will be worthwhile if it results not only in opening up the Fed, but it, if it results ultimately in its abolition. <laughs> uh, I can hardly think of another arm of government, agency created by government, that has more fully and destructively failed the promises that we were sold over the years about what it would do for us than the Federal Reserve. Uh, over the years, it's been, you know, we've been told that this organization, this central bank, would uh, uh, iron out the business cycle, it would uh, promote full employment, it would be careful to provide just the right amount of currency. You know, it would do all those cent wonderful central planning things that a central bank is supposed to do. But what have we had in the year since 1913 when it was created? One Great Depression, you can lay at its doorstep, even Ben Bernanke is admitted to that. Uh, I don't know, nine or 10 or 12 recessions linked in each case to an erratic monetary policy of the Fed. A dollar that's worth maybe a nickel of what it was when the Fed started out. I mean, that is manifest total failure. And if, if, if a private firm had been put in charge uh, and told, this is what you must do for us, provide just the right amount of money, blah, 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 do all these other things, gee, I think they'd be swinging from trees by now. I mean, seriously, I think we'd, we'd be running them out of town for, uh, for that kind of performance. So, uh, so I'm all for auditing it, but I hope it, it, it. I hope the process produces more awareness of just how harmful this institution is. And then uh, the, the the bank stress tests. That uh, you know, I, I I can't say I'm much of a student of that. I, I haven't looked at them carefully, but uh, I can offer a, maybe a more broad interpretation or opinion of the uh, of the whole stimulus effort. Um, I, let me add a dimension you, you might not have heard as much. I mean, and you've all heard because you have great economists here, uh, some, I'm sure, very good economic critiques of the stimulus. Let me just add a bit of a moral one, too. Because ultimately, I think so many of our economic problems stem from uh, some uh, moral sins we're committing. And uh, if I were to ask you, is it right to take a dollar from the responsible and give it to the irresponsible, most of you would probably say there's something wrong about that, right? Is it right to take a dollar from the innocent and give to the guilty? Most people would say, oh, that's not a good idea either. Is there anything about doing that a trillion times that makes it right? Aren't you just a trillion times more wrong? Uh, and yet that's what we're doing on a grand scale. And somehow when you, when you, when you rip off people to this, ex to this extent, to the, trillions of dollars, you forget the moral uh, underpinnings of it all. And it's hard for me to see a, how a policy that is rooted fundamentally in the immorality of seizing money from some who didn't cause a problem and giving it to those who were part of the problem, it's hard for me to see how the end result of that is good policy, good outcomes. At best, you're patching over a problem for the moment and perhaps making it worse for the long run. Okay, so I was listening to your uh, to your speech, and I was also looking at uh, Romer '92, uh, what ended the Great Depression, and uh, Sh Anna Schwartz and Freeman's analysis of monetary history. Now yeah. they seem to think that the depression, both the initial one and the one we had in th at end of '37, '38, was entirely caused to exogenous money supply shocks, and we can pretty much ignore everything FDR did as either inconsequential or besides the fact. Would you agree with that statement? I would agree with it to this extent. I think if uh, that what, what happened with monetary and credit policy uh, in both cases was sufficient to cause, you know, first a boom and then a bust to some degree. 
But it, I don't think it explains the depth or the severity or the duration. Uh, and I do think that these other things that Roosevelt uh, was doing had a uh, very substantial negative impact. So I, I, I would just maybe not emphasize monetary policy. Uh, I certainly wouldn't emphasize it exclusively. I think these other factors were severe. Um, wouldn't the fact that the Fed has destroyed 96% 90, of the dollar's purchasing value since 1913 boost our exports? Or to boost our exports? It's a joke, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you go to school? <laughs> no, I just I always thought that I could destroy the dollars. Weimar Germany really had a great export market in the 20s. No, yeah. um, 